it would be nice to have robots that do more of the tasks that I don't want to do. The freeing up of people from doing less valuable jobs to more valuable jobs. Once upon a time, there were robots, and they were working alone in factories. But there was one very important thing about those robots. They were separated by people. And so in my world, I'm thinking about what is the future of robotics? Is it the Jetsons and Rosie? Or is it Terminator? And I don't like this picture, but I sure like that picture. So this is where, what we think about in how we develop human-robot interaction, the opportunity to bring robots into our lives. And there's reasons why I believe now that this is possible. One of the reasons is because robotic devices are certainly getting more humanoid and having more and more ability. So on the left, you see Jason, which is a robot constructed at the DLR, German Institute for Robotics. That's the Robonaut I'm shaking hands with. And then this is a Geminoid, which is a robot that's designed to act and look and appeal to people. I find it a little creepy. There's a whole other talk I can tell you about that, but uh, a hum very humanoid robot. When it gets really close to humans, so the geminoid robots, that's when you start to really enter the uncanny valley. As long as the robot is um, more, uh, what would I say, if, it, if it's just an arm, then people aren't uncomfortable with it. But if it's an arm with skin and a hand and it starts to look, you know, more realistic, it's not good. Uh, people like the sort of cartoony shaped robots, those things make it appear more friendly. Um, so yeah, it's the not quite right human piece that really pushes people off. Computational power, it continues to grow, and that when we combine it with deep learning, you are able to do much faster uh, optimization on data sets, and that allows us to uh, make decisions at a very fast speed. The other thing, of course, that's happening is uh, the internet of everything. Uh, everywhere you go, pretty much, you can pick up a signal now. So that ubiquity of connection and communication is also changing the way for robotics. And therefore, we need to think about how we are going to get along with the robots. And so these are Isaac Asimov's three laws. And as you can see, it's important that they're in a certain order, because if we have them in any other order, we end up typically with a kill bot hellscape, and we don't want that. And that means we really do need to think about people working with robotics. I think that there are things that we can get robots to do that allow us to do things that we would rather do. Because who really wants to clean toilets and vacuum? Not me, that's for sure. So being able to have that be done, um, I think that's where you want robots. Pr I think there's also real opportunities, again, around delivery, also around telepresence, so that it, ability to be somewhere else with a robotic avatar that can allow you to experience the place without being there is something that is going to save us a lot of airplane trips. So I don't think they've got telepresence robots right yet because it's still hard and clunky to use. But uh, as we learn how to have, how to control robots, but also how to have them navigate and share cooperation, um, that will improve, uh, that will be another really great application. In my work, when I'm thinking about how um, we're gonna collaborate with robots, some of the things that we need to think about is some very, very basic stuff, like sharing. Another question that we ask is about sharing space with a robot. So if you're in the kitchen and you're working with someone else and you're both reaching for something, there's this little thing that happens called a hesitation where you kind of reach for something and they kind of reach for something. And through observing each other, you have to make a decision about who's going to win. So how do we do that as people? Well, we do it by these hesitation gestures and the person that's more persistent seems to be able to win that. This is our base case, no collision avoidance. Oh, that's not looking good. And so this is what would a base case when the robot just 
is not giving any kind of quarter. So people don't like that. One would think that if the robot would just immediately stop, that would be a good thing, because then you would think, okay, the robot's avoiding me. But the problem with that kind of motion is that people get very confused by it. They don't know whether the robot's going to continue. They don't know why it stopped. But when we use the hesitation gesture, people infer from the hesitation gesture that the robot has recognized them and that it's ceding control to them. And so the interaction makes it much more comfortable for people to use the robot. People are very comfortable with the more human-like motions. So that doesn't seem to create an uncanniness. In fact, that's more like a cartoon because it's doing that nice, um, calmly smooth motion that they understand. And so the understandability about motion does not cause, you know, an uncanny feeling. It's more the, the look, I think, that, that, that upsets people. The other thing that people use a lot is visual cues. So we wanted to ask the question about the importance of robots having heads, really, and having eyes. Does it have a value beyond um, just the, you know, being able to acquire visual information? So we had the three different uh, combinations. We had the no gaze or teenager handover. We had the shared attention gaze where the robot was looking at the handover location. And then we had the turn-taking gaze where the robot went from handover location up to, to making eye contact. And what we see is there's actually an earlier launch into going for the bottle when the robot is looking at where the bottle is. And that's, that's actually quite remarkable that that gaze cue has a measurable impact on the efficiency of the interaction. We've sort of developed a bit of a, a process for uh, understanding what the interaction should be. And so the first thing we do is this human-human trials, and it involves bringing a broad selection of people so that we are making sure that we're not sort of zoning in on a, a particular quirk of a type of person. You know, we want males and females. We want them from different age groups. We want them... Um, from different walks of life and different cultural backgrounds. So it does take um, the, you know, a lot of work to, to, to really understand what the interaction is so that it, it can be validated. Um, from there, we break it down and we understand actually the mechanics of that. So what the motions are, what the control is. And then we actually take those motions, prototype them on a robot, and then often what we'll use is something called Mechanical Turk with Amazon, where we'll display those uh, motions to people online, and we'll ask them to categorize them and recognize them to validate whether the motions that we're generating with the robot are actually valid, understandable motions. And then the last piece is then when we bring people back into the lab, with the robot and do the experiments again. So it's quite a, quite a long process, um, but that way we know that the data and the results that we have are well validated. What I'd like to say is that if we think about designing robotics in the context of things that can do to help people, and if we focus on the people in the design instead of on the technology, then I think the future can be very friendly and much more like Rosie and maybe much less like the Terminator. We don't know where it's really going to go. What we do know is that we need to design around what people's needs are, what they will accept. And we do know that when we go into different cultures, there will be different levels of acceptability. Some people will be very happy having robots in nursing homes and other people will not feel comfortable with that. Um, I think if the outcomes are better for the people that use it, then we've done the right thing. But, you know, it's got to be up to the people.